Do you take a seat? Oh, I've got my Bible. And uh, we need God's help, so let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your living word. Thank you too for the gift of your Holy Spirit who helps us to understand it. Lord, please be at work in each one of us now, we pray, so that we might hear, believe, and obey your word. In Jesus' name, amen. My title is The Sealing of God's Promise of Salvation. Genesis 17, which we heard earlier on, is the chapter to have open in front of you. This is the last in uh, our series on Abraham's life of faith. We began in chapter 12 with God calling Abraham, as Elspeth, Elspeth was reminding us, uh, Abraham, as he was called then, to leave behind everything that was familiar to him and to go trusting in the promise that God gave him. And that is the foundational promise for the whole Bible. Why? Because that is the promise that despite all their sin, God is going to save his people and bring in his kingdom. And that is the promise that is fulfilled in and by Jesus. So those of us who've put our trust in Jesus as our Lord and our Savior, and who are trusting in Jesus for eternal life, are heirs of that promise to Abraham. The New Testament is clear about that. So for instance, the Apostle Paul says in Romans 4 verses 16 and 17, that the promise given to Abraham is guaranteed to all who share the faith of Abraham, I quote, who is the father of us all. And Paul says in Galatians 3, verses 13 and 14, that on the cross, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law so that in Christ Jesus, the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles, those who are not Jews. So it's helpful to see that the whole Bible, from Genesis 12 to the book of Revelation, is all about the unfolding of the fulfillment of that promise, first given to Abraham, gradually filled out, and coming to its climax in Jesus. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 20, for all the promises of God find their yes in Christ Jesus. That is why it is through him that we utter our amen to God for his glory. So the life of faith, the life of trusting in Jesus through all the trials that we face is a life of believing in his promise of salvation. We are called to rely on that promise without wavering rejoicing even in the midst of sin and suffering because it is God's promise, so it's true. Vivian and I were given a very generous and rather wonderful Christmas present. It was a voucher. On the voucher was printed, is printed, a promise. It's a promise that we can have dinner, bed and breakfast for two days and nights at a particular luxury hotel. We don't yet know when we're going. We do know it is paid for. There is nothing for us to pay. And we are looking forward to it very much. Now, if we get impatient and we decide to go to a different hotel instead, our voucher will not work. We'll be told, wrong time, wrong place, go away. 
But nothing that will happen, between, uh, happen to us between now and then will change the fact that we are going. We have to keep believing the promise. And that voucher reminds us of it every time we look at it. The life of faith in Christ is a life believing in God's promise of eternal life through Christ. It is all paid for. There are no shortcuts. It's guaranteed. Abraham was the pioneer of this life of faith for all of us. He is our father in the faith. Now, we should really only need to hear God's promises once. God is trustworthy. That should be enough. But God knows very well that we're not very good at believing his promises. That is our fault. It's not his fault. But he's very gracious and patient. So he turns his promises into covenants. What is a covenant? It is just a formal binding promise. And then what is more, God doubles down on his covenant just to hammer it home. So the promise is given to Abraham in chapter 12. And then it's turned into a formal covenant in chapter 15. Pete Alston took us through that. Listen to it online if you weren't there. And now in chapter 17, there is the doubling down on the covenant and a new element as well, the covenant sign of circumcision. So let's take a look at Genesis 17 in four chunks. And I have a heading for each one. So first of all, the reaffirming of the covenant promise. So this is verses 1 to 8 of chapter 17. And I've decided that it's going to help us to take this in if I reread these sections in full. So here is 1 to 8. And look out for the reaffirmation of that promise. When Abraham was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abraham and said to him, I am God Almighty. Walk before me and be blameless, that I may make my covenant between me and you and may multiply you greatly. Then Abraham fell on his face, and God said to him, Behold, my covenant is with you, and you shall be the father of a multitude of nations. No longer shall your name be called Abraham, but your name shall be Abraham. For I have made you the father of a multitude of nations. I will make you exceedingly fruitful. And I will make you into nations. And kings shall come from you. And I will establish my covenant between me and you and your offspring after you throughout their generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and to your offspring after you. And I will give to you and to your offspring after you the land of your sojournings, all the land of Canaan, for an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. So here is that repetition of the promise from chapter 12. It's like when you're expecting a delivery from Amazon. You don't just get one email saying, we've got your order. You get another saying, it's on the way. And then another saying, it's getting closer until it arrives. So God graciously repeats his promise. Abraham's very great age is a reminder that this is a supernatural, divine covenant that's being talked about. Only God can make this happen. It's not a deal between Abraham and the Lord. It is God's initiative, and God alone will bring it to fruition. And what fruition, what fruit, a multitude of nations is multiplied. And so more and more people and nations, generation after generation, an everlasting covenant. And that many nations make clear right from the start that we're not just talking about Abraham's blood relations here but about children of faith, children of the promise. And that promise of kings is an early hint of the line of David that will culminate in Jesus, the King of Kings. 
Abraham was so awed by what he was hearing that he fell flat on his face, unable to stand, just as John does at the start of the book of Revelation when he sees the risen Christ. And this 4,000-year-old promise to Abraham drives us on to John's vision of heaven in Revelation 7, verses 9 and 10. After this I looked, and behold, a great multitude that no one could number, from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, crying out with a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. The covenant promise is wonderfully reaffirmed. Secondly, the covenant sign is given. God's covenants have physical signs attached to them. God made us bodies and souls. The covenants come before the signs and they don't depend on them. But physical signs are a God-given help to us, slow as we are to grasp the gritty physical reality of what we've been promised. These physical signs are ordinary things, nothing new. But what is new is the significance that God gives to them. So the earlier covenant with Noah had a sign. That was God's promise to the whole of humanity that he would never again wipe us all out with a flood, even though we deserve to be. The sign, the rainbow. And I hope you remember that merciful covenant promise every time you see a rainbow. The sign that God gave with the promise to Abraham was, of course, circumcision. Listen out for it in verses 9 to 14. You can hardly miss it. Here they are. And God said to Abraham, As for you, you shall keep my covenant, you and your offspring after you, throughout their generations. This is my covenant, which you shall keep between me and you and your offspring after you. Every male among you shall be circumcised. You shall be circumcised in the flesh of your foreskins, and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and you. He who is eight days old among you shall be circumcised. Every male throughout your generations, whether born in your house or bought with your money, from any foreigner who is not of your offspring, both he who is born in your house and he who is bought with your money shall surely be circumcised. So shall my covenant be in your flesh, an everlasting covenant. Any uncircumcised male who is not circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin shall be cut off from his people. He has broken my covenant. It is not always so by any means. But every now and again in history, there is a distinct advantage to being a woman. And note again that right from the start, it wasn't just Abraham's descendants by birth, but every man belonging to the covenant community who bore the sign of it. The sign of circumcision seals the covenant. It doesn't create it. So it wasn't Abraham's obedience in being circumcised that persuaded God to make his promise. The sign sealed what was already given. That is crucial, as the Apostle Paul teaches in Romans 4, where he says, this is Romans 4, 11, Abraham received the sign of circumcision as a seal of the righteousness that he had by faith while he was still uncircumcised. The sign of circumcision has been superseded with the giving of the new covenant in the blood of Jesus, that new covenant expanded the promise of salvation beyond the Jews only to all who have faith in Jesus from all the nations of the earth. And Jesus gave us new physical signs of the new covenant. The water of baptism to mark the beginning of the life of faith in Christ. The bread and wine 
of the Lord's Supper to remind us again and again as we continue the life of faith in Christ until the day we die or Jesus returns to take us home. For over 40 years, I have worn on my finger a gold ring. 41 years on the 28th of this month, a date I must not forget. <laughs> but my ring reminds me. This ring did not create the marriage covenant between Vivian and me, but it signs and seals it. The covenant promise is reaffirmed, the covenant sign is given. Then thirdly, the covenant child is confirmed. Three weeks ago, Ramsey movingly took us through chapter 16. And the turmoil and suffering that Abraham and Sarah both went through and also caused for others as they sinfully struggled in the face of their decaying bodies to believe God's promise of a son to them who would carry the covenant down through the next generation. Genesis 15 verse 4, your very own son shall be your heir. They had tried to force God's hand, but that never works. We have to trust God and live by faith. And God is patient, merciful, full of grace. So here in chapter 17, verses 15 to 21, God confirms that promise of a son for the ancient Abraham and Sarah. And God said to Abraham, As for Sarai, your wife, you shall not call her name Sarai, but Sarah shall be her name. I will bless her. And moreover, I will give you a son by her. I will bless her, and she shall become nations. Kings of peoples shall come from her. Then Abraham fell on his face and laughed and said to himself, Shall a child be born to a man who is a hundred years old? Shall Sarah, who is ninety years old, bear a child? And Abraham said to God, Oh, that Ishmael might live before you. God said, no, but Sarah, your wife, shall bear you a son, and you shall call his name Isaac. I will establish my covenant with him as an everlasting covenant for his offspring after him. As for Ishmael, I have heard you. Behold, I have blessed him and will make him fruitful and multiply him greatly. He shall father 12 princes, and I will make him into a great nation. But I will establish my covenant with Isaac, whom Sarah shall bear to you at this time next year. So this time they're even given a name for the boy, Isaac, and a month for the birth, one year from now. But still looking at his feeble self, Abraham cynically laughs and doubts. And in the next chapter, Sarah, looking at her feeble self, laughs too. And we do need to look into our own hearts. Do we silently and cynically laugh inside when we hear God's promises to us? Are we harboring bitterness because we doubt God's goodness in our own lives. Well, that cynical laughter of Abraham and Sarah was turned to joy when Isaac was born. Isaac means he laughs. The last laugh was on God. There's a song by Geraldine Latty based on Psalm 30 that was a lifeline to me years ago at a hard time when I was in danger of giving in to that kind of cynicism. It goes, I'm not going to sing it, it goes, weeping may endure for the night, but joy comes in the morning. Hold on, hold on, God will see you through. That is the voice of faith in God's promise.
That is the life of faith we are called to live, like Abraham, like Sarah. And the fruit of faith is obedience. That's what ends this chapter. The covenant promise is reaffirmed. The covenant sign is given. The covenant child is confirmed. Then finally and fourthly, the covenant command is obeyed. They grit their teeth, or at least the men do. Maybe there was more laughter among the women, who knows? And they get on with it. Verses 22 to 27. When he'd finished talking with them, God went up from Abraham. Then Abraham took Ishmael, his son, and all those born in his house or bought with his money, every male among the men of Abraham's house, and he circumcised the flesh of their foreskins that very day, as God had said to him. Abraham was 99 years old when he was circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin. And Ishmael, his son, was 13 years old when he was circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin. That very day, Abraham and his son Ishmael were circumcised. And all the men of his house, those born in the house and those bought with money from a foreigner, were circumcised with him. 99 and 13, old and young, family and foreigners, they all obeyed. Over and over again, we're told, so we don't miss the point, so to speak. That is what the Apostle Paul in Romans chapter 1, verse 5, calls the obedience of faith. Under the new covenant, the sign is a lot less painful, and it's for men and for women. And what a joy it was last Sunday evening to see our brothers and sisters in Christ receiving the sign of God's promise of salvation to them as they were baptized. All of us, like Abraham, are called to the life of faith. And all of us, like Abraham, are called to the obedience that flows from that faith. It's not a burdensome obedience. It is a joyful obedience because of our confidence in where we're headed with Jesus by our side, constantly reminding us of his covenant promise. Philippians chapter 4, verse 4, Rejoice in the Lord always. Again I will say, Rejoice. So let's rejoice that God promises salvation, that he signs and seals his promise, that we are heirs of that promise to Abraham as we trust and obey our Lord and our Savior Jesus. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we praise you that you are a promise-giving, promise-keeping, faithful God. We praise you that all your promises are yes in Christ your Son. Heavenly Father, never let us forget. Keep us joyfully looking forward to that day when he will take us home to be with you. Teach us, Lord, to live by faith in you. In Jesus' name. Amen.